Well, your Royal Highness, uh, first uh, of all, I would like to thank you uh, for being with us. I think it is the fourth, uh, if not the fifth uh, time that you are uh, attending, participating in the World Policy Conference. So first, I want to thank you very much. It's always a great honor and pleasure to have you. And uh, we are going to have a conversation, uh, starting the two of us, but quickly we will en enlarge it. And uh, my, my first question uh, will not be totally uh, unexpected, I suppose. Uh, Saudi uh, Arabia uh, seems to fear uh, the outcomes of the negotiations which have uh, started uh, with the Iran, the, the so-called five plus one uh, negotiations, and also to be uh, concerned with uh, the evolution of its uh, relationship with the uh, United States. So uh, could you comment on that to start the discussion? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, Thierry de Montbrial is uh, um, someone when he says, you come, you come. And so I have not been enough times at the World Policy Conference, so, but today I hope to make up for past uh, absences. Um, your question is relevant, and I've heard it repeated in many uh, events and uh, through many people, and I think it starts from a wrong premise. Uh, and that premise is that uh, Saudi Arabia feels that it is, uh, as you said, uh, concerned or worried about any um, engagement between the United States and Iran. First of all, Saudi Arabia engages with Iran. It has embassy in Tehran, and Tehran has an embassy in Riyadh. And we've had uh, that engagement since the rapprochement between the kingdom and Iran that occurred in 1995 when the present king, who was then Crown Prince, met with uh, then President Rafsanjani at an Islamic summit conference in Pakistan. And relations had been broken during Khomeini's time uh, because of various events that took place in the holy places in, in, in the kingdom and other uh, terrorist acts against Saudi interests in different parts of the world. And so uh, th that rapprochement took place, and since then, uh, we've been engaged with Iran, as I said. Uh, the last president of Iran, Mr. Ahmadinejad, uh, met with our king at least four or five times uh, during his, uh, his reign in, uh, in, in Iran. And the king is, uh, is, a, is a man who is very frank and very blunt. And engaged with uh, uh, Ahmadinejad on those two bases, even publicly. Uh, so uh, to consider that the kingdom would be against uh, American and, uh, and Iranian engagement is mistaken. Um, furthermore, I think the five plus one talks uh, with Iran, uh, you remember how they started. Uh, it was the E3, um, uh, versus Iran, uh, and then it was the EU 3 plus 1, and then EU 3 plus 2, etc., and now it's the 5 plus 1. Uh, I think the kingdom and the Gulf states particularly would like to see that uh, progression in numbers continue one more time, uh, so that the 5 plus 1 um, will become 5 plus 2 with the Gulf Cooperation Council represented on these talks, because after all, uh, the five plus one are talking about our area. And it is our interests that are at stake here more directly and more immediately than the European or the American or the Russian or the Chinese for that matter. Just consider on the nuclear issue, not only the military aspects, but simply the, the aspects of a potential accident in a nuclear facility um, 100 and some 20 kilometers away from 
our shores uh, on the Gulf. And we have very large population uh, centers on our side of the Gulf, from Kuwait going all the way down to, to Oman. That potential for, for uh, a natural disaster exists. Iran, as we all know, lies on very uh, unstable grounds, uh, and not just politically. Uh, but uh, also uh, geographically. And so uh, any accident, as we've seen in the last year, two earthquakes in the area of the Boucher reactor. So you can imagine our concern from that aspect. And engaging with Iran and going forward on eliminating any questions or uh, any concerns about the development of nuclear weapons is good for us. Uh, the GCC countries met a few days ago at a summit conference in Kuwait at which they expressed their welcome of the uh, agreement recently signed in, in Geneva. But it also made, the, the GCC made the point that this is an interim government, an interim agreement. And we will hold our applause until there is a final uh, agreement that eliminates any possibility of Iran developing weapons of mass destruction. Uh, thank you very much. Do, now, uh, assuming that there is in the not too distant future uh, a permanent agreement on the nuclear, uh, the nuclear issue, uh, how, could we go, how could we go beyond that to stabilize the, the Middle East as a, as a region? Or to put my question in a different uh, way, is it possible to have any uh, order in the Middle East without some positive cooperation between some of the major actors, including Turkey, Iran, uh, Saudi Arabia, and perhaps uh, Israel, and uh, maybe one or two Egypt, perhaps? Uh, so, uh, would, do you think that uh, success of the negotiation on the nuclear uh, dimension could pave the way for a more uh, profound uh, settlement of the Middle East uh, issues? I'm holding my, my, my views on, uh, on whether or not these interim talks will lead to a final and agreed to uh, settlement on Iran's nuclear uh, ambitions until we see what those agreements uh, can be. Uh, my, prefer my preferred view is that we should have in the area a zone free of weapons of mass destruction. And in that context, uh, I will remind our distinguished audience that uh, in the uh, non-proliferation treaty review conference that was held in 2010 in New York, following from the previous review conferences, the MPT signatories, all of them, including the five permanent members of the Security Council, uh, agreed to have a conference on the issue in Helsinki, Finland, that was supposed to be held December, like this month, in, uh, in, in Finland, uh, two years ago. Uh, last year, sorry, 2012. Unfortunately, two weeks before that conference was supposed to be held, the United States simply issued a statement saying that there was no ground to believe that this conference will succeed, and therefore we think it should not be held. Needless to say, I disagree with that opinion of the United States, and I think that is where the issue of nuclear proliferation and nuclear uh, armament uh, should be uh, dealt with. To secure two things. First of all, a level playing ground of all of the countries in the Middle East that you mentioned, not just Iran or Saudi Arabia, but including Turkey and Israel and others, Egypt, who may have uh, views on this subject. But also another aspect I think that is needed to make this zone free of weapons of mass destruction a workable entity is to get from the five permanent members of the Security Council two guarantees for this zone. The first guarantee should be that they will um, provide a nuclear security umbrella for the area of the zone. 
and I'm talking about the five permanent members jointly. And the second guarantee is that they should sanction uh, any country seen to be developing a weapon of mass destruction in the area, not just by economic and diplomatic and political sanction, but also military sanction. With these two guarantees, I think if you allow for a period of, let's say, five years during which the countries of the zone should resolve the issues between them to make the zone a viable entity and to eliminate any fears or questions on any of the members of the zone. Uh, we have, I remember when I first made this proposition several years ago to some uh, European diplomats, the first response that came from them was that Israel is not going to accept. And my immediate first response to that first response is, so what? Uh, if Israel doesn't accept, let it be. You establish the idea of the zone, you provide the guarantees by the five permanent members, and then you let Israel come in and negotiate whatever it is that they want to negotiate. The same with Iran. And so uh, these are, I think, uh, ideas that more precisely and, and more workably can be done rather than devoting, as we have seen, has been devoted 10, 11 years to the negotiations with Iran, um, and yet we're still not there. And we're not sure that even when we get there, that there will not be more to come. Uh, but it is an issue that is very much alive in our part of the world, and I think we require the necessary attention from the rest of the world to see that we have a stake in it. So uh, these ideas of yours, which you have been trying to promote, yes. uh, how uh, do you think they have been received by the countries which uh, matter uh, for this game, if I may say so? And but this takes me back to the question of the United States, to which you did not really answer. I don't know how the, these countries take it. So far, I've been making these ideas, discussing them with officials for several years without much, uh, much response. But I think there is, as we see in the press and in the media, not just in the United States, but in Europe and in other places, there is a general growing uh, uh, attention to this issue. Uh, and uh, there are various groups uh, around the world that are working uh, to uh, promote the idea of a zone free of weapons of mass destruction in the Middle East in both Europe and America and in the, in the Middle East. So uh, I hope that they will come around to, uh, to uh, agreeing to these kinds uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, proposals. Uh, as far as the relationship with the United States, we've had since 1933 when the first uh, oil companies started coming to dig for oil in Saudi Arabia a very long and uh, well-established relationship based on mutual benefits and, and interests. During these nearly 70 some odd years, uh, we've had our, up, our ups and downs, uh, needless to say. Um, the first up, if you like, that we had was the meeting between King Abdulaziz and uh, President Roosevelt uh, on, uh, on the Red Sea in 1945. That's when the official relationship started with, uh, with America. Uh, at that time, President Roosevelt came to King Abdulaziz with the idea that uh, he, he wanted to convince him to accept the principle of um, settling uh, Jewish refugees from the European um, uh, uh, theater into, into Palestine because they were being persecuted in Germany and so on. And the king's response to President Roosevelt at the time was, well, if, he, if the Jews are being persecuted by the Germans, why settle them in Palestine? Uh, give them the best piece of land in Germany and let them stay there. Uh, anyway, the, rela the uh, negotiations between the two ended when uh, President Roosevelt gave assurances to King Abdulaziz that he will not make a decision on that issue until he coordinated and consulted 
with the king and other Arab leaders. This uh, uh, assurance was uh, repeated by President Truman when he succeeded uh, President Roosevelt uh, soon after his death. Uh, but by 1947 and 48, when the elections were coming up in America, uh, President Truman simply forgot about the issue of consultation and went ahead and not only recognized Israel but provided all the necessary uh, help uh, for it. That also affected the relationship. And the issue of Palestine and Israel has been a continuous uh, point of contention between Saudi Arabia and, and the U.S., uh, culminating, if I may say, in the 1973 oil embargo, if you remember. Um, so the relationship between the kingdom and, and America has been going up and down since then. At the moment, on the issue of Syria, on the issue of nuclear non-proliferation, on the issue of, uh, of the uh, uh, nuclear talks with Iran, we have our differences with the United States, and we express them publicly. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the relationship is only those three topics. At the moment, I don't know if there are any Americans here, um, but we have more than 100,000 Saudi students in the United States, spread all over the United States in various universities. And that program has been going on now since 2005, and it will continue. So on that aspect, the human uh, relationship aspect, the relationship between the two countries is going forward. On business aspects, I think America still is our primary uh, trading partner. Uh, on uh, other issues uh, like defense and security, we have full uh, strategic consultation with, uh, with the United States. So it's not a one-sided uh, uh, relationship that we have with the United States, but a multifaceted one where the interests of the, of the two countries coincide on a lot of issues, but they diverge on, on some other issues. By the way, there are a number of American citizens in this room. I think, I hope they will intervene uh, in the conversation, but uh, nevertheless, uh, there seems to be currently a crisis of trust uh, at, the, at the highest uh, level. Could, could you comment a little bit on that? Well, I can comment on, on my personal and, and non-official uh, view because I do not represent the government. Uh, but what I, he I hear from Saudi public there is an issue of, of confidence. Um, when you have uh, a president of the United States declare um, uh, statements on topics that affect us, uh, we take it for granted that he will stand by those statements. Uh, more um, clearly was the issue of the so-called red lines in Syria. Uh, we've seen several red lines put forward by the president uh, which went along and uh, became pinkish as the time uh, uh, grew and, and eventually ended up completely white. And so that kind of, of, of assurance when it comes from, from a leader of the country like the United States, we expect him to stand by it. I'm not saying that President Obama doesn't have his problems. Of course he does. And he inherited a country that is almost bankrupt and in two wars uh, with depletion of not just material but human lives as well. Uh, and I'm sure he's thinking in terms of what is best for the United States. But when you have people that you deal with, especially in the Middle East, that have long-standing interests and, and uh, um, have engaged with you uh, directly and without any hesitation on defending those interests, you should be able to give them the assurance that what you say is going to be what you do. Uh, and I think uh, I wrote here um, for the benefit of the world, I hope for the benefit, for the benefit of the World Policy uh, Conference, a paper on, 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 on Palestine. And uh, le let me just read to you what, what, what a few sentences from here of, of what I wrote because I think they reflect on this issue, on the overall uh, confidence and, and, and uh, trust. 
I say here, uh, Mr. Kerry has to resist Netanyahu's unceasing efforts to deflect the final status aims of the talks into an interim agreement that still denies the full rights of the Palestinians to an independent, contiguous, and viable state with its capital, Jerusalem, and its refugees settled through an agreed procedure between Israel and Palestine. The sight of a U.S. House of Representatives applauding the denial of basing human rights to the Palestinian people cannot and should not obstruct the American people from supporting the unalienable rights of Palestinians as enshrined in all divine and human criteria and as enjoyed by all the people of the world. I ought to go on to say that uh, now well into Mr. Obama's second term, Mr. Kerry is attempting to achieve what has not been achieved before, an Israeli-Palestinian peace treaty. The world is watching and will not apl uh, applaud a truncated peace. Kerry faces two obdurate, sly, and totally devious pair of opponents, Netanyahu and the American Congress. They will do everything to put a wrench in the wheel of Mr. Kerry's vehicle of peace. If the president retreats from his position on compromise along the 1967 border, as he did on his red line on use of chemical weapons by Assad, then the whole enterprise of peace between the Arabs and Israel will evaporate. These are, I think, uh, expressions of what I believe affect the whole issue of, uh, of trust. And if you look at, at nuclear non-proliferation, the US government basically scuttled that issue of, of zone free of weapons of mass destruction. If you look on Syria, as I mentioned, the president went back on many, many uh, statements. If you look on, uh, on uh, the issue of, of reaching out to Iran and, and so on, it was obvious from the president's first term that he wants to reach out to Iran. Uh, and so we were not surprised by it, but what was surprising was that the talks that were held to go forward were kept from us. And not just from us, but apparently even from the other uh, P5 uh, plus one uh, members. So uh, how can you build trust when you keep secrets from, from uh, what are supposed to be uh, your closest uh, allies? So what? To so what? We go forward. Uh, I think, the, uh, as I mentioned before, the, uh, the uh, applause for a final uh, P5 plus one Iran deal will be held until we see the final um, uh, issue resolved. And it's interesting, I, I noticed in, particularly in this past year, the issue of six months seems to be um, uh, a necessary component of any of the developments in our part of the world. You have the, the Iran agreement based on a six-month interim term. Uh, you have the Palestinian issue now remaining six months. Uh, and, and you have other issues connected to, to six months. I don't know what it is, anywho, whether it's a question of, of, of Einsteinian time plus uh, place uh, issue or simply a, a, a convenient device uh, to keep us waiting and not uh, upset the, 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 the cart uh, uh, barrel enough during this, this six months. But when the six months are finished, what's going to happen? I don't know. Parenthetically, uh, last uh, time at the fifth uh, WPC, we had a very interesting session uh, related to the banking world of the concept of trust and uh, Jean-Claude Trichet uh, remembers that very well because he was on the spot. Uh, the difference between trust and confidence. I use the word trust and you use the word confidence. Do you make any difference between the two words? I, I don't quib quibble on, on, <laughs> on um, very uh, uh, esoteric uh, <laughs> vocabulary, <laughs> vocabulary the, the distinctions. But I think trust and confidence are the same. Yes. And you have to have one in order to have the other. Let, before I, uh, I, I open the floor for, for, for discussion, could you tell us uh, uh, what would be, in, in your uh, judgment, uh, 
best case uh, hypothesis, a best scenario before the end of the second term of uh, President Obama, and what would be a worst case scenario? Uh, I, I read, we are talking about the Middle East, of course. <laughs> I, I wouldn't because there are so other many issues. other possi <laughs> possibilities. <laughs> well, in the Middle East, I think the talks Mr. Kerry is holding with uh, Mahmoud Abbas and Netanyahu are quite important. And I hope and wish for uh, success there. I, I will keep my skepticism alive until I see what, what they come up with. But if they do come up with, I think that will roll out a lot of, of, of uh, subsequent um, uh, issues that, ha that are equally affected by this, uh, this matter. Um, that to me is, is, is the crucial um, aspect of the relationship, not just between Saudi Arabia and the United States, but between the Arab and Muslim world and the rest of the world, if you like, particularly the West. If you can solve that problem, and it is a problem that is solvable, I mean, everybody knows what the solution is, which is a compromise along the 1967 borders with mutual guarantees and, and uh, swaps and things like that. They've talked about it in Taba, they've talked about it in Annapolis, they've talked about it in so many places, yet no one has had the political will to put it in, in practice. Mr. Kerry is devoting a lot of energy and effort, and that is to be applauded, but how far he will get, if he doesn't get the president's full support on that, I think we, we have to see what happens there. You seem to be skeptical. I am, I'm, I'm inevitably skeptical uh, from what I've seen. I mean, this is uh, not something, uh, an issue of yesterday, it's uh, more than 60 years that uh, this has been uh, an issue. So to restore trust, this is more important uh, or, or to uh, trigger positive developments in the Middle East. What you are talking about, the Kerry negotiations are more important than the fate of the Iran negotiation. I don't think you can put it in those terms because they're all connected. Yes. And, and that connection makes the resolution of one beneficial for the other. Uh, so uh, removing from the table um, a long uh, uh, standing conflict uh, that has been depleting human and, and material resources uh, considerably will help in pushing forth uh, the other issues like the nuclear issue of Iran, like the problem in Syria. Uh, the problem in Syria today, I think, is, is, is not only a tragedy, but it's a, it's, it's a clear, in my view, it's, it's a clear um, uh, uh, negligence on the part of the world who continue to watch the suffering of the Syrian people without taking steps to stop that suffering. It's almost, I, I think it can reach the level of being a criminal negligence on the part of the world community. And to allow it to continue and to fester like that uh, is, is unacceptable. Thank you very much. So I will give the floor first to the American citizen, Walter, and second to an Israeli citizen. <laughs> to a Lebanese citizen. Uh, I'm, Walter I'm Walter Statler. My background is that of a career uh, di US diplomat, although I'm not here in that capacity today. Uh, you clearly uh, have undergone a great deal of frustration, but of course, as you know, you're not the only one, uh, either in the Middle East or in uh, the United States or North America. Uh, could you come up with uh, two or three practical, uh, doable steps that could be taken uh, during the course of the next uh, uh, 12 months or so that would indeed enhance uh, the two terms that I was thinking of as well, trust and confidence, uh, and possibly stability in uh, that part of the world? And my other question is, uh, have you been talking to uh, your and our uh, partners and allies who have been involved in this uh, process as well. 
Well, I have suggested um, what I think is a doable and practical uh, proposal on the zone free of weapons of mass destruction. I'll just repeat it uh, um, briefly. The, the five permanent members of the Security Council who are also the declared nuclear states uh, in the world uh, issue a statement from the United Nations Security Council saying we, the five permanent members of the Security Council, want to see a zone free of weapons of mass destruction established in the Middle East. And we will offer the following guarantees to make this uh, zone workable a nuclear security umbrella for the members of the zone, and sanctions, including military sanctions, against any of the countries seen to be developing a weapon of mass destruction. And you, the potential members of the zone, you go and fix your problems in the next five years so that that zone can be made workable with these two guarantees in your background. That, I think, is a practical step and can be done very easily because, don't forget, all the five permanent members of the Security Council have declared a policy of the removal of all nuclear weapons from the world. So they don't have to convince themselves of that issue to achieve this uh, zone free of weapons of mass destruction. And even in Israel, there have been leaders like Yitzhak Rabin and Ehud Olmert who said that they would, be cons they would consider the issue of nuclear removal from the Middle East if there was peace and they could be assured of their safety uh, should that issue be, uh, be brought to the table. Iran, ironically, is the country that first put the idea of then a nuclear free zone in the Middle East during the Shah's time in 1974 and have continued to support the idea of the zone free of weapons of mass destruction. So uh, it's, it shouldn't be difficult to get us all together. One uh, positive aspect that I heard recently is that since the scuttling of the conference in Helsinki, there have been two meetings of the, uh, uh, the, the countries that, that I think they're called the trustee countries or something like that, England, uh, the United States, Russia, and the UN, um, uh, the United Nations, uh, they've met with representatives from uh, most of the, of the uh, zone, uh, potential zone members. The last one was held, I think, uh, last month or, or a couple of months ago, um, at which 17 Arab countries attended, Israel attended, but Iran did not. So there is at least some progress there or having Israel sit with 17 Arab uh, countries on this specific issue. And that could be built on. On the issue of, of Palestine, I think we've always said that we need the big bear behind our backs to push us to overcome whatever reluctance may be in our political um, uh, arena. Uh, if the Prime Minister of Israel can point to the big bear pushing him uh, behind him, he can tell his, his opponents in the Knesset and in the political parties in Israel, do you want to anger the big bear? Uh, and the same with Mahmoud Abbas. Unfortunately, the big bear has not proven to be very bearish-like. Um, uh, recently, and I think this is where Mr. Kerry's role has become so important, because he is actually playing that role now, and he, ne he will need, as I said, the support of the president uh, to get things done when the crucial time comes for Netanyahu and Abbas to look at the really important issues like Jerusalem, like uh, land swaps, like... Uh, uh, security arrangements, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, that's where the big bear has to not only bare his teeth, but also extend his claws and be ready to to do his job. Thank you very much, Mayor Shetrit. We were, we were in the same business at one time, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I, I know. I, 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 I. So you you trust each other. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Trust but verify. That's yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs>
Your <laughs> Highness, I'm glad to listen. I'm glad I was glad to listen to you. I think I would uh, dream about the possibility if you do come to the Knesset and make that speech in the Knesset. You find that many Israelis will agree with you, and most of you what you have said. Maybe except of the, of the rejection of Saudi to settle Israel in Pal Israelis, Jewish in Palestine. But with the rest, I find myself agree with most of what you say. Practically, Israel is, the, according to foreign uh, sources, is the most effective one to prevent countries in the Middle East from having a nuclear weapon. We did it in Iraq. According to foreign sources, we prevent it from Syria. Suppose it hadn't been done in Syria, what could happen today? And I think that in this situation, I'm the biggest supporter of the Arab Initiative, which was Saudi Initiative. But again, I tried to push it in many governments, which I was member, or been member in government of Sharon, of Olbert, etc. He's a member of the government, a minister. And I tried to push it very strongly. I found in Israel a very big support in this initiative. Thank you. The problem is how to move it. We cannot move the initiative only by talking to Palestinians. I think if you will be the bear to, I mean, Saudi will be the bear to push this initiative, that will be the best solution. Because in that case, if we have the Arab initiative coming true, with the same price which any way we will pay in order to have peace with Palestinians, we can have peace with 56 Islam countries. Including the normalization, it will change the world, it will change the Middle East. That's the reason why I support it in all my heart. And secondly, it's the best guarantee for existence of that peace. Because if we have peace with all the Arab world, nobody can dare to break it. And I believe that we have to give it a push in order to move ahead. When I try to push our prime ministers to call Riyadh and ask them to join and let's negotiate this, this initiative, they said they're not accepting. And I believe that Saudi, when they come up with the initiative, they expect us to negotiate with Palestinians, come to an agreement, and then the Arab initiative will take over. It doesn't work. The facts are, if you remember, that Olmert is suggesting to Abu Mazen almost everything seemed safe in the Arab initiative, and they refused to sign. The same thing happened with Arafat, when Barack and Clinton offered him almost everything, and he refused to sign. The reason, in my opinion, they refused because they cannot take the decision needed on their side to give up what they call the right of return. Your initiative was very clever and very wisdom, was phrased in the saying, you have to find agreeable, justified solution to the Palestinian refugees. Agreeable meant that Israel had to agree. And I believe that nobody in Saudi or Arab leaders believe that Israel can really accept back into Israel Arab refugees, rather than they should go to the Palestinian state and maybe compensate them. That's the point, in my opinion, which is the main obstacle for the Palestinians to sign an agreement. Maybe you can be the bear to push it and solve this problem. And you're welcome to the Knesset if you would will. I'd be happy to arrange it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. L let me just uh, remind you that um, uh, Saudi Arabia put out not just the Arab Peace Initiative, but a previous initiative under the late King Fahad in 1981-82, it was called the Fahad Plan. And it was the first time that after Camp David with Sadat and uh, Begin, um, the, that the Arab world, all of the Arab world, accepted the existence of the State of Israel. Uh, if you know, I don't know if, if you remember, Yanni, before that, it was used to be called the alleged State of Israel. But from 1981-82, all the Arab countries, including half of al-Assad in Syria and uh, 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 Saddam in Iraq, etc., Abu Qaddafi in Libya, they all accepted the Saudi view that Israel exists, it's in our borders, and that borders should not be changed. That was the main thrust of the, of the, uh, of the, the Fahad peace plan. What happened when, when King Fahad put it forward? It got full Arab approval, but not even a word from Israel. And he, uh, Israel totally ignored that, uh, that issue. And then the Arab peace initiative uh, that King Abdullah put forward in 2002, when he did it, what was the response from Israel? At that time, I remember correct, uh, and succinctly that uh, uh, Prime Minister Sharon was the Prime Minister. His uh, 
political advisor, uh, Dov Weisglas, said, des described this initiative as the most dangerous uh, threat to, to Israeli uh, existence. And no Israeli leader after that would accept that the initiative was there to be discussed. Uh, President Perez said, no, there are some good language in, in, in the initiative. Ehud Olmert uh, said equally similar words about, about the initiative. I think Zippy Livni equally gave it some, uh, some, uh, some very guarded uh, support. But no official statement from any US, uh, from any Israeli representative either said, okay, we will discuss the Arab Peace Initiative. We, we have our reservations, but let's sit down and talk about them. So if Israel is not willing to talk to what we propose to them, I don't think Saudi Arabia would be willing to talk to Israel unless they do. That's one aspect. On the aspect of whether Israel is, is, is the best guarantor of preventing the spread of nuclear weapons in, in the area, I'd happily accept that if I saw Israeli Air Force planes bombing Dimona uh, <laughs> reactor in Israel, <laughs> not just the ones in, 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 <laughs> in Iraq and in, in, in Syria. Israel has nuclear weapons. You know that and I know that. And, and so, yeah, it's simply to come to us and say, yes, we will be your guardian angel and prevent the Iranians from, from accepting it. Well, for God's sake, and get rid of yours first and then we can talk. But that, that is, I think, all hypothetical. On the issue of making gestures, of coming to, to, uh, to the Knesset and so on, it's not going to happen. I, I wish there was some, some, some way that I could convince myself that that would be a viable step in the direction of, uh, of promoting uh, the Arab Peace Initiative. But if there is no official response to that initiative, no Arab leader, or I think even any uh, individual, will come to the Knesset because they simply don't trust that the, <laughs> there will be the necessary um, action taken after that. So accept the Arab Peace Initiative, sit down and talk with the, Israeli, with the Palestinians, and then, as we say in Arabic, لكل حادث حديث, to every discussion, there is another discussion. So. Um, that is what Israel should do, I think. Which is very much illustrated by the current conversation. So now I have two options. Okay. One is that I could leave my seat and organize uh, Israeli-Saudi uh, uh, dialogue. But I am not sure that this is totally uh, wise, at least this year. The other option is to continue the program as planned, but we are running be behind a schedule and we have a tight schedule. So I will take three questions. I will take three questions. I will ask each of you to be concise, even Mr. Tabet, uh, short. I will ask you, uh, your Royal Highness, to uh, answer as briefly as possible. Okay. And then we will con continue immediately with the session with uh, Itamar uh, Rabinovich. So if I don't leave my seat, your royal highness, you, you, you will leave yours. Okay. Uh, okay. But no one will interpret that as a political uh, 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 move. Uh, and uh, we will um, uh, try to end on time because Madame Pauline Marois uh, <laughs> have to leave immediately after lunch to catch her plate. So we, the, the schedule is quite tight. So my three, the three questions are Ambassador Farid Yassed, uh, Yassed uh, Farid, Farid, where are you? Uh, you are from Iraq. Then uh, Ambassador Im Sun Jun from Korea. Uh, South, South Korea, you know. I, uh, Sun Jun, I was going to say, unfortunately. <laughs> but, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and last but not least, Monsieur uh, Riyad Tabet from Lebanon. Okay? So, Farid. Uh, thank you, Thierry. Thank you, Your Highness. Uh, actually, I have a question, but before that, uh, there's a statement that I have to make having to do uh, about Israel's role in preventing uh, Arab states from going nuclear, military nuclear. Uh, and the Iraqi example is quite telling. Um, Iraq had developed a excellent, with French help, research nuclear reactor that had very good, first rate, really first world class uh, experiments conducted by 
first-rate Iraqi physicists who had studied in the U.S. and in, in the U.K. He is, he, he's a physicist himself, by the yeah. way. Yeah. Um, uh, I know what I'm talking about. Uh, when Israel bombed Oziraq, Saddam convened the Iraqi Nuclear uh, Atomic Energy Commission and decided to denounce the Non-Proliferation Treaty. It was then and there that the Iraqi physicists who were there, who were incensed at what Israel had done, decided to go full blast and help Saddam develop a quite exceptional program of enrichment. Iraq was the first country since the Americans to pursue five different tracks to enrichment. All the others, uh, all the other nuclear countries uh, that came after the United States pursued one or two. But Iraqis pursued all five tracks. All of that because they were spurred and angry at what Israel had done. Um, so don't do this again. Don't bomb. I don't think it's the way to do things. Uh, and I think the statement that was heard earlier is, is somewhat a bit self-serving. But I do have a question to His Highness. Uh, one uh, issue that was not addressed enough is, is Syria. It's an issue that is on our hearts in Iraq. We've been through hell over the last 10 years. By the accounting of the best accountants of uh, victims in Iraq, a group in the United Kingdom called uh, Iraq Body Count, we've had about 120 to 130,000 deaths since 2003. In Syria, that number has been ex exceeded in just two years. It's really a tragedy. Um, people are preparing themselves for this next milestone, which is Geneva. What can we do, in your mind, to make Geneva a success? And what can Geneva be like? And I'm asking you this question because Saudi Arabia was involved in a previous effort, a regional effort, to bring peace to the area, namely the Taif agreements, where it had a predominant role. So based on that experience, what do you think we could do uh, as an international community as regional players to make Geneva as successful as it can be. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sunjun. Well, thank you, <coughs> Thierry. I mean, uh, uh, thank you for, uh, you know, you said I come from South Korea, not North Korea. <laughs> well, uh, uh, I was uh, very um, struck and impressed uh, with the formula uh, with which we, uh, you can uh, resolve the uh, Iranian nuclear issue. I mean. Uh, Your Highness, I mean, suggested I mean two uh, elements: uh, security guarantee and uh, military sanction. Uh, well, uh, my question uh, first is that: uh, How uh, could you, I mean, impose military sanction uh, for a country which has uh, quite uh, sizable military capability? I'm afraid it could uh, lead to a military conflict or uh, eventually a war. And uh, uh, my second question, uh, my mind immediately moves to a more dangerous, more grave I mean, nuclear issue uh, in our region, uh, which is North Korean development of um, uh, nuclear weapons. And uh, uh, I was uh, involved with the negotiation to resolve this issue for a long time, uh, longer than uh, maybe negotiations with Iran. Uh, we have been uh, in negotiation more than 20 years, but without uh, much re uh, fruit. And uh, uh, do you think, I mean, your formula could be uh, applied to the case of uh, North Korean nuclear issue? Thank you. Thank you, Riyad. <laughs> Micro is coming. Merci. Uh, Votre Altesse, uh, votre antagonisme avec l'Iran <coughs> a des conséquences sur le terrain. Nous le voyons à Bahreïn, nous le voyons en Irak, en Syrie et particulièrement au Liban. Est-ce que vous ne pensez pas que cet antagonisme pourrait générer un conflit et même une guerre intercommunautaire entre les chiites et les sunnites dans la région, car le problème de l'Iran sur lequel se focalise l'Occident n'est pas que nucléaire, 
qui a d'autres conséquences sur le terrain. So three simple questions. And the, thank you because they have, all the questions were extremely short. <laughs> Uh, je vais essayer de parler en français. Si oui, 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 oui. Um, L'antagonisme que vous décrivez uh, de l'Arabie uh, saoudite vers l'Iran, uh, du côté de, 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 de l'Arabie saoudite, c'est le contraire. C'est l'antagonisme iranien vers l'Arabie saoudite qui a qui était le, le commencement de, ce, de cette, uh, uh, je ne peux pas dire conflit, mais divergence de, de, de politique et d'opinion de, entre les deux pays. Alors, le, le roi euh, Abdallah a proposé euh, quelques euh, euh, efforts pour euh, euh, avoir une belle une, une, une relation de, de, de respect mutuel et même d'amitié de, de, entre l'Iran et l'Arabie saoudite. La dernière, c'était le plus, le plus profond, je crois. Euh, c'était pendant le, le mois de Ramadan, le plus euh, saint euh, mois de, de, du calendrier euh, musulman. Euh, L'année dernière, quand il a euh, convoqué euh, une conférence de sommet, de sommet euh, islamique euh, au Mecque, c'est le Mecque, n'est-ce pas La Mecque, oui. La, la Mecque, à la Mecque, euh, pour euh, discuter cette question de divergence entre, euh, entre les, euh, le, le monde chiri et le monde sunni, dans, dans le monde islamique. Et euh, Ahmadinejad était là-bas, et euh, autres représentants de, de pays euh, pas seulement de, 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 du monde arabe, mais tout le monde euh, islamique. Et on a euh, conclu le, la conférence avec un agrément d'avoir euh, un centre de, de dialogue entre le Shia et le Sunna euh, dans le, le, la ville de Médine, la sainte ville de Médine euh, en, en Arabie. Et c'est ça la, la politique de l'Arabie saoudite c'est d'embrasser, de, de, de euh, pas, mais euh, comme, comme ça, euh, les euh, embrace in English, euh, euh, notre, notre euh, euh, frère musulman, n'importe quelle, quelle, quelle direction. Et euh, vous avez dit qu'au qu euh, Liban, c'est l'antagonisme saoudien. Est-ce que vous, euh, vous êtes euh, en train d'entendre les, les mots de M. Hassan Nasrallah récemment Elle dit que c'était l'Arabie saoudite qui a euh, mis les, les bombes euh, à l'ambassade iranienne dans le quartier chiite qui était protégé par euh, Hezbollah. Euh, C'est seulement un exemple que M. Nasrallah a, a dit vers l'Arabie saoudite. Euh, si vous euh, retracez ces, ces mots depuis euh, qu'il est, qu est devenu le, 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 le chef de, de Hezbollah, vous aurez dû avoir euh, l'antagonisme que lui, représentant de l'Iran, euh, a vers, vers l'Arabie saoudite. En Irak, euh, aussi, euh, si vous suivez les, euh, les mots et les, euh, les euh, discours de, 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 des imams chiites euh, dans l'Irak vers l'Arabie saoudite, décrivant l'Arabie saoudite comme le pays de, de terrorisme, de, de wahhabisme, euh, etc., etc., euh, euh, ce n'est pas euh, un signe d'amitié euh, vers l'Arabie saoudite. Même si vous, si vous suivez les, les, les discours des imams chiites en Iran, même sur les, 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 les chaînes de télé, télévision et chaînes radio bombardées contre nous, euh, vous aurez dû avoir que c'est... 
l'ennemi de, de l'Iran, c'est très, très grand contre l'Arabie saoudite. Et je ne sais pas comment on peut convaincre euh, nos confrères musulmans en Iran que l'Arabie saoudite euh, n'essaie pas de, de les, de les euh, faire mal. Chacun, nous avons presque, depuis cinq ans maintenant, presque un million d'Iraniens qui viennent pour faire le pèlerinage et le petit pèlerinage en Arabie, chacun, euh, chaque année, on peut dire. Et ils sont reçus avec euh, hospitalité, avec euh, con, euh, cordialité, etc., etc. Et comme j'ai dit, nous, nous avons essayé d'engager de, avec, avec l'Iran depuis euh, 95, mais c'est l'Iran qui a les, les troupes euh, militaires en Syrie. Euh, c'est l'Iran qui a, qui a engagé Hezbollah de, de, à l'invasion de la Syrie. C'est l'Iran qui a engagé les brigades Abbas de l'Irak euh, pour l'invasion de, de la Syrie. Et c'est l'Iran qui, qui, qui a pressurisé les, les partis chiites en Irak d'accepter M. Maliki comme premier ministre. Et cette interférence et ce euh, jeu d'hégémonie de, 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 de euh, vers les pays arabes n'est pas acceptable. J'ai dit dans un de mes discours que euh, nous, dans le monde arabe, n'accepterons de, de porter les, les vêtements euh, 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 occidentaux. Euh, même, en même cas, nous n'aurons pas euh, accepté de porter les robes euh, iraniennes, euh, parce que c'est nous qui, qui vont décider notre, notre futur. Ce n'est pas l'Iran, ce n'est pas les États-Unis, ce n'est pas l'Europe. Et de cette de cette façon, je crois que c'est à l'Iran de, de montrer leur euh, bon, bon euh, goodwill euh, vers nous. Bon exemple. Pour le Corée, uh, um, for, for, for Corée, je speak en anglais. Je voudrais que je puisse parler coréen, mais je ne sais pas. Pour le Corée, je ne sais pas si ce que je propose est applicable à North Korea. Uh, or not, uh, because I don't know much about the situation in North Korea. You're better placed to make that, uh, that decision. But I think zones free of weapons of mass destruction are the way to go to remove any potential uh, nuclear conflagration. And I agree with you that uh, a threat of use of force uh, to establish a zone in the Middle East uh, may start a war, but I think This is what we in the zone have to consider when we are making our decisions on whether to acquire weapons of mass destruction or not. And the other question, you have to remind me what it was. Uh, Farid, Farid Yassin. Uh, the question from Iraq. Uh, Farid, can you just repeat the, the question itself very short, hopefully. Uh, Syria. Uh, Syria. 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 Ah, well. I think in as much as I propose uh, a five permanent members Security Council um, statement to come on the zone free of weapons of mass destruction, I don't see why the five permanent members of the, of the Security Council can't issue an equal statement saying the fighting has to stop in Syria. And this will mean that Assad will get no more weapons from Russia and Iran, that Hezbollah will have to withdraw from, from uh, Syrian territory, the uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guards fighting on the ground will have to withdraw from Syrian territory, et cetera, et cetera. And we, the five permanent members, agree on that and wish to see it happen. Uh, that, I think, will go a long way to mitigate any of the, of the uh, military ambitions of any side there. <coughs> Je vais, finir, je vais finir en français, mais malheureusement, il n'y a pas d'eau, là. Je vais finir en français, puisque vous avez bien voulu parler 
français un, un instant. Si quelqu'un pouvait apporter de l'eau, ce serait sympathique. Euh, et je vous remercie, je remercie très vivement votre Altesse okay. royale. Je vais moi-même tâcher de survivre euh, à, à cette session. J'espère que vous allez euh, participer à, à la suivante et peut-être intervenir euh, à nouveau. Donc, je vous remercie de tout cœur. C'est pour vous, c'est pas pour moi, ça Non, non. Ah, bon, je croyais <rire> que c'était là. Euh, et donc, je vais demander tout de suite à M. Itamar Rabinovich de bien vouloir euh, venir. Mais, I promise you, je vous promets qu'on va changer le nom et que M. Rabinovich ne va pas s'asseoir sur votre siège. Well, believe me... We've sat together at a discussion, remember in Princeton, was it? Mr. Rabinovich, where is Mr. Rabinovich? Where is he? Uh, ca ca come, come, Itamar. Oh.